Good evening. I'm uh, Rama Padila, Assistant Professor in Physics and Astronomy at Clemson. Today I'm going to be talking about some stories from the Nanobio Lab and the Clemson Nanomaterials Institute. All the work that I'm going to present is possible only because of our hardworking undergraduate and graduate students at uh, Clemson um, and uh, funding from uh, different agencies, NASA, NIH, uh, SCF score, NSF, and uh, industrial partners, Hayward and SCRA. Our research is mainly centered on nanomaterials, which comprises condensed matter physics. And using these nanomaterials as the platform, we venture into different areas and hence different interfaces, uh, energy, health, and information technology. So this naturally involves a lot of interdisciplinary research at the nanobio interface, for example, to develop biosensors, which I will talk about, or nanochemistry interface uh, for developing better batteries and, and uh, capacitors. Today, uh, I'm going to use graphene as an example uh, to describe a couple of uh, areas that, that we work on. Graphene is one atom thick layer of uh, carbon atoms, and uh, we use this effectively for energy storage or, or biosensing applications or to make optical diodes. So talking about energy storage first, uh, you can uh, see this Ragoni plot which describes specific power versus uh, specific energy. Uh, essentially tells how much energy a device holds and how fast it can deliver it. If you look at capacitors, they have little energy, but they can deliver it very fast, unlike batteries, which hold much higher energy, but deliver it slowly. And we have been working on a hybrid electrochemical uh, uh, capacitors that can hold uh, more energy and also deliver it uh, uh, comparable to uh, capacitors with the idea of ultimately developing batteries and supercapacitors that can displace gasoline, uh, which is up here, uh, literally off the charts, because uh, it contains so much energy and it can deliver that uh, so, so fast. Uh, so in this regard, uh, activated carbon, nanocarbon, has been used widely to make electrochemical capacitors or supercapacitors because of its high surface area. So when it has high surface area or more number of parts, it can store more charge and hence hold more energy and at the same time deliver it uh, very fast. An electrode in such a capacitor is made by mixing some sort of a carbon material, a nanocarbon or activated carbon with binders like butyl rubber or, or uh, PTFE, Teflon, uh, and, and pasting them on an aluminum foil current collector. However, with these kind of uh, electrodes, there are still many challenges that, that, that we face that are mainly one is accessibility of ions, that, that the electrolyte ions in the supercapacitor should have access to internal pores within the material so they can access the entire surface area for, for storing charge. Another issue is the resistance that comes mainly from the non-conducting nature of the binder that is used. And also carbon, although it conducts electricity, it's, it's more of semi-metallic or semi-conducting nature and, and not, a, not a good conductor like metals. But most importantly, there is another effect that is very, very important, which was, which was mainly discovered at Clemson in the physics department by our group, uh, and and uh, also we, we found ways to alleviate this, which is called quantum capacitance. To understand quantum capacitance, let's take a football example. Uh, so when you are taught ca capacitors, we usually teach about parallel plate capacitors with metal plates. So you can think of these metal plates like the uh, Death Valley, um, but in case of carbon electrodes, these are not metals, they're at best semiconductors. So, uh, for example, uh, if you look at Death Valley, uh, you know, let's say, suppose the first per person is admitted for a ticket price of $1, and the ticket price increases every time one row is filled, let's say. So, so then, if, if you assume that in the first row, let's say, some 100 people can sit here, then for all those 100 people, the ticket price would be $1. So uh, you would get $100, and when there is the first person after 100 people, 101, 
uh, then that person has to pay two dollars because he's going to go into the uh, second row, for example. Uh, but if you look at Tillman Auditorium instead of Death Valley, then you obviously have less number of rows, uh, so, sorry, less number of seats in a row. And so the ticket price goes up very fast. For example, uh, if there are only f uh, 10 seats in, in the first row, so uh, when 10 people come in, the first row gets filled. So when the 11th person comes in, she may have to pay uh, $2 to sit in the second row. So, so the ticket price increases much faster in the case of auditorium than in case of Death Valley because there are more number of seats per row. And that's the difference between a metal and a semiconductor. In a metal, there are a lot of number of seats within each row. So the ticket price, every time you admit a new charge, is, is not, it doesn't go up drastically. But, but in case of a semiconductor, the ticket price goes up. So it's not um, uh, energetically advantageous. So uh, in, in, in other words, if you, if you put this into equations, in case of a metal, there is no extra voltage drop coming in because metals have a high uh, density of electronic states at the, at the Fermi level. Uh, but in case of a semiconductor, because there are not enough seats in a row, there is an extra voltage drop that comes in, which is what we call as delta V quantum. So in case of a normal parallel plate capacitor with metals, you only have this delta V, which is completely dependent on uh, the, the where the capacitance is completely dependent on the geometry of the of the plates. But if you don't have enough rows in a seat, you get an extra term called the quantum uh, drop that, that comes from the uh, quantum capacitance. And this quantum capacitance is in series with the total capacitance. And so uh, the, the lower capacitance dominates, so it dwarfs the total amount of energy one can store in, in, in such a capacitor system. And uh, the way to increase this quantum capacitance is to simply add more number of seats in each row. So if you add more number of seats in each row, then the ticket price uh, wouldn't go up so fast, like in the case of Tillman Auditorium that I just uh, described. And uh, to do that, what we did was we took these graphene sheets, which are one atom thick layer uh, of carbon atoms, and then we bombarded it with argon ions. So once you bombard it with argon ions, you end up creating these pores, these defects. And these defects add new electronic states. They introduce new, new seats in each row. So by controlling these defects, by choosing the right kind of defect, uh, you can you can um, introduce more seats and and hence increase the the, the quantum capacitance. Uh, so we first did that with a few layer graphene grown on a nickel foil using um, chemical vapor deposition, and uh, we used different powers of argon ions from 10 to 50 watts to induce these pores into into carbon sheets, and uh, you can see that as we increase the power along the x-axis, you can see that the measured capacitance increases, but beyond a certain power, specifically about 25 watts, you can see that the capacitance begins to drop. That is because now you have put in so many defects, so many pores into this graphene sheet that, that the sheet itself uh, becomes very insulating and, and very bad uh, for, for storing charges. So there is an optimal sweet spot here uh, as to how much, how many pores you can induce to add more seats in a in a row, and we also tested with this this with different electrolytes. Uh, different electrolytes mainly have different sizes. So when you have uh, an electrolyte like TBAPF6, it's a very long name, uh, but but let's call it just TBAPF6. It's it's roughly around 0.8 nanometers. Uh, whereas TEABF4 is roughly around 0.4 nanometers, which can fit between two layers of graphene. So in graphite, these layers of graphene are like a deck of cards, and the space between two cards is roughly equal to the size of this TEABF4 electrolyte. Uh, and TBAPF6 is twice as large. So as you can see, the lower size electrolyte uh, is able to go more easily through these pores and uh, sit in between, intercalate between these two layers and uh, give rise to a higher capacitance. So going beyond this uh, uh, nickel foil, we, we used a nickel foam uh, and, and grew 
uh, graphene on a nickel foam using uh, uh, chemical vapor deposition and made coin cells. Um, and then uh, we were expecting higher capacitance, but uh, what we observed was that the capacitance was not very high when you when you put this device together. And we re we realized the reason is that although we increased the number of rows within a, a number of seats within a row, we increased the quantum capacitance. We reduced the electrical conductivity of this graphene foam by inducing so many pores. Um, so we wanted to uh, see if we can solve both the problems simultaneously, that is add more seats per row and also increase the electrical conductivity. So to do that, instead of just putting pores, what we did was we put pores first and then annealed it in, in acetonitrile so that these pores are filled with uh, nitrogen dopants. So nitrogen is has has a lone pair of electrons, so it can contribute this lone pair of electrons to graphene and improve its its electrical conductivity. And uh, as we expected, uh, by using nitrogen instead of just pores, as you can see in the red curve here, we get a much higher capacitance and it is much more stable than either the uh, porous graphene foam or just the normal graphene foam. Uh, and, and it has pretty much a flat line here uh, when, you, when you look at the power density. That is, it can, it can provide much higher capacitance than, than uh, you know, the, the commercial 100 millifarad uh, uh, supercapacitor that you can see here. So we were also able to translate this uh, into large power cells that are, that are flexible and uh, that can be run for 10,000 cycles. So you can see how thin uh, this, this pouch cell is, uh, and it contains uh, graphene foam, as you can see here, and we were able to run it to till 10,000 cycles uh, without any uh, significant deterioration in, in the performance. It goes from 120 millifarad to uh, 116 uh, millifarads, and all this work is published in um, advanced materials that, that uh, citation is provided here if you're looking for uh, more details. So now switching gears, like I uh, showed in the beginning, uh, we use these nanomaterials for different applications and I just talked about how we use that in energy storage. Now let's look at how we can use that for biosensors to detect diseases like COVID, for example. So traditionally uh, in, in, in biosensors we use um, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or, or ELISA. So uh, that can measure things like antibody levels or detect viruses, detect hormonal changes, or, or detect uh, inflammatory cytokines or, or different, different things. So uh, the way it works is that you have something called a capture antibody on the, coated on the plate. And when you add the analyte that you want to sense, for example, if this is the COVID antibody, this would be maybe a drop of blood or, or the sputum or something, some sample that is dropped onto this. And then we have um, a detecting antibody that sort of sandwiches this analyte between two antibodies. And then uh, you have the secondary antibody, which is added. And, and if there is this analyte, uh, these antibodies don't get washed away, and so they, and then they fluoresce. So, so you can see um, uh, how how much of this uh, analyte is in the sample by looking at how much fluorescence you're you're getting. So you're using this fluorescence as a signal, as an indicator uh, for for the amount of uh, analyte in here. So going beyond this, uh, we developed a new and easy technique that can rapidly detect without the need for expensive instrumentation or without the need for waiting for hours to, to actually look at uh, the analyte. So this is called analyte-induced disruption in luminescence quenching. Uh, I know that's a, a long term. Uh, we simply call it aid luck. Um, and here what we have is we have a graphene sheet at the bottom. So graphene has carbon bonded in sp2 configuration. So there are these PZ pi orbitals, electron cloud, on the top and the bottom of the graphene sheet. And when you put uh, any fluorescing molecules or fluorescing quantum dots onto this graphene sheet, then this electron cloud that is on top and bottom of graphene sheet quenches their fluorescence. That is, without graphene, they would fluoresce 
in incident light but with graphene they would not fluoresce because their fluorescence energy is non radiatively transferred to to graphene so if you add an analyte then that analyte if it binds these green color antibodies that are coated on these uh, cadmium selenide quantum dots the antibodies sort of lift it up from the graphene surface so once this is lifted up the quenching is disrupted so in the in the first case there is quenching because this quantum dot this purple color quantum dot is in contact with the graphene surface below and these green things are similar to the capture antibody that you have seen before and the analyte if you choose the right antibody for the right analyte they 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 form sort of a lock and key pair so when they attach this quantum dot is lifted up from graphene and then it begins to fluoresce again and this fluorescence could be further enhanced by adding by embedding gold nanoparticles into into the graphene layer so uh, when when the uh, antibody is uh, attached and, and it lifts the quantum dot above the graphene surface you get much higher fluorescence because the nanoparticles the gold nanoparticles at certain wavelengths of light especially green uh, and and visible wavelengths they enhance uh, the the fluorescence and emission by changing the distribution of electric field uh, within the sample so more details about this work are detailed in this paper uh, in in nanoscale and um, and so you can uh, see how we make this graphene paper we we uh, just take a regular printer paper and and we make a graphene suspension and isopropanol with gold uh, gold nanoparticles and then uh, we 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 spray coat it onto this regular printer paper so at the at the end you get this black color graphene coated paper and then we use cadmium selenide quantum dots and we we uh, coat this cadmium selenide quantum dots with the appropriate antibody based on what we want to uh, detect for example if you want to detect covid antibodies you would do anti anti of that antibody for example if it's an igg antibody you would do anti igg antibody would be attached onto this um uh cadmium selenide quantum dots and these quantum dots after we conjugate them with uh, say anti igg antibodies we drop them onto um, the, the graphene paper and then you have graphene coated paper with quantum dots like i had shown you before but now because these quantum dots are in close contact with graphene their luminescence is completely quenched because of the non radiative energy transfer so here you can see in the red curve these are just purely cadmium selenide quantum dots so when you have an incident light then you see very high intensity of fluorescence without any graphene just cadmium selenide by itself but if you put these cadmium selenide on graphene then their fluorescence is completely quenched and you can see in the blue line that is because now the electron cloud on top and bottom of uh, graphene sheet is sort of soaking up this energy this fluorescence energy from cadmium selenide quantum dots so that's why they don't glow anymore right so uh, we when when we add the right appropriate anti uh, analyte then that analyte lifts this quantum dots up and then you can see the uh, fluorescence again and uh, that's what we had done with uh, starting with biotin streptovidin pair um, so this was just for testing so streptovidin was attached to cadmium selenide and biotin was used as the analyte and biotin streptovidin have uh, the, the the best non specific interaction known so when 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 biotin attaches to streptovidin then the quantum dot is lifted up above the surface so you begin to see the fluorescence again so as you add more and more of biotin you get more and more of fluorescence because more and more number of uh, uh, quantum dots are lifted above the graphene surface so that's what you can see here so we start with uh, say the control that is uh, no um, biotin at all so that's that's somewhere here very low uh, fluorescence but as you add higher and higher amounts from 1 nanomole to 10 micromole you can see a concomitant increase in the fluorescence intensity but we could also add uh, gold or silver nanoparticles in this case gold nanoparticles to redistribute the electric field in such a way that we get much better sensitivity right and and uh, and with by by adding uh, gold nanoparticles 
we were able to go down to a sensitivity of uh, 10 femtomoles compared to one nanomole without um, the gold nanoparticles and you can see the concomitant increase here so so with uh, with by using graphene and gold together we are able to quench the quantum dots efficiently and also redistribute the electric field effectively such that we were able to achieve uh, 10 femtomole uh, sensitivity and after having tested it with biotin and streptovidin uh, we tested it with IgG antibodies and uh, here you can see so anti-IgG antibody was first attached to the cadmium selenide quantum dots and then IgG is used as the analyte and even in this case we were able to go down to 100 femtomoles and we tested these in complex biological environments like like uh, serum and uh, uh, especially fetal bovine serum and we we are still able to see the same sensitivity and uh, with, with with high amount of specificity even if there are uh, possible interfering molecules um, in addition to just just igg so using this adlac platform we made an inexpensive uh, sensor for for covid and uh, uh, we recorded a six minute video on how we how this covid sensor covid antibody sensor uh, functions using adlac which i'd like to uh, show you now and uh, with that video i'd like to end my talk thank you hey i am ramakrishna pudila and i'm going to talk to you about Analyte induced disruption in luminescence quenching, or simply ADLUC, and how this can be used for detecting COVID antibodies easily using a smartphone. To perform ADLUC assay, we mainly need graphene coated paper, and we use a scalable roll to roll fabrication method by spray coating graphene onto regular printer paper to make graphene coated paper. As you can see here in the video, the spray coating process is quite simple, very effective and very fast. After coating the paper, we get graphene coated paper. On this graphene coated paper, we deposit cadmium selenide quantum dots which fluoresce in red color when excited with a green laser. We conjugate these cadmium selenide quantum dots with anti-IgG human antibodies and after the conjugation process this cadmium selenate quantum dots are drop casted on the graphene coated paper so from this anti-igg antibody coated paper we cut out one square centimeter coupons and these coupons look this way in electron microscope here, the special thing is that cadmium selenide quantum dots fluoresce when they are on normal paper, as you can see in the red curve. But when they are on graphene, their fluorescence is inhibited or quenched because graphene pi orbitals reduce the fluorescence of cadmium selenide. We use that to our advantage to perform the Edluck assay. So here we have one centimeter squared coupon with cadmium selenide quantum dots coated with anti-IgG antibodies. When IgG antibodies in the blood sample are added to the platform, the IgG antibodies bind the quantum dots, lifting them up above the surface. As the quantum dot is lifted above the surface, it begins to fluoresce because it is no longer in contact with graphene. This fluorescence can be further enhanced by using gold nanoparticles. The addition of gold nanoparticles enhances the fluorescence due to surface plasmon resonance. Now, to test how well this detect can detect IgG, we can drop, cast an IgG analyte in known concentrations, incubate for 15 minutes at room temperature, and then measure the fluorescence in the lab using a spectrometer with a 532 nanometer or a green laser. So this is how the results look from the lab spectrometer. We are able to see that this platform is capable of measuring 10 femtomoles of IgG very accurately. We also tested this in a complex environment like the blood serum. Our 
platform was able to selectively and sensitively detect IgG even in a complex environment like the blood serum. Now, how can we translate this to the smartphone? To do that, we used a paper craft spectrometer. All that you need to do is simply print this out and, and fold it into a spectrometer using a CD drive as the grating. Now, once you have built the spectrometer, you can calibrate using Light Analyzer app on Play Store and obtain the spectrum from any fluorescent lamp source. Once the spectral features are obtained, the app is now calibrated. Now, we can perform the same assay that we did in the lab but instead drop blood onto the graphene platform and now use a laser pointer, a simple keychain pointer to shine on the paper and click a picture with your smartphone. And here is an example of that. Now, because the camera is calibrated, it can detect the fluorescence from the quantum dots very easily. And here is the laser peak without any analyte. With one nanomole analyte, you see a little bit peak. With 10 nanomoles, you see a little higher peak. And with 100 nanomoles, you, you see a much higher peak. So all that you need to do is drop blood onto this graphene platform, wait for 15 minutes, use a simple keychain laser pointer, and then Click a picture of a smartphone and you can see whether antibodies are present or not present. How about the cost of production? Here we show the values or price for gold, graphene, quantum dots and the IgG antibodies. Based on these costs, we are able to estimate that the cost of one one centimeter square coupon with anti-IgG antibodies including the cost of laser pointer is around two and a half dollars one coupon can give you four tests so cost per test is effectively just under a dollar around 0.6 dollars note that these prices are based on just kilogram quantities but if produced in bulk in, in a scaled up process this cost can be further reduced this kind of a smartphone sensor for detecting COVID antibodies would be very helpful in distributing the vaccine.